um, delighted to speak to you all. I haven't spoken to anyone who's out there doing real work um, in the classroom for, for ages, months and months, so it's great to have this, this line of contact with you. I'm a cognitive psychologist, but I'm most interested really in just common problems that kids have in schools. So um, after many years of research, became um, somewhat jaundiced with doing research, looking at kids with rarefied disorders, um, specific diagnosed disorders, and feeling that we're missing out on the majority of kids who were struggling in school. So um, what I'm going to do today is tell you, draw together some of the work that we've been doing. And um, given the steer that I've had from the, um, the leadership team at, at the uh, university um, school, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about what might be done in, in classroom terms for kids with these common problems. So uh, let me start off with the first uh, a few facts on working memory. Um, so um, I don't know if it's a familiar term to you, but working memory is um, it's a term used just to capture very loosely that capacity we all have to hold in mind um, information and to manipulate it as required, just for, just for a very brief period of time. So a really good everyday example is someone gives you an, a, a phone number and you have to watch the room next door to be able to find a pen and paper to write it down. So you're holding that information in mind. You know that if anyone interrupts you or if you think about anything else or maybe you just won't be successful, um, it's too, there's too many numbers to hold, you'll actually forget that information. And that perfectly captures the experience of what it's like when you're trying to use working memory. It used to be called short term memory, but the term working memory is used more often now because it, it captures the fact that we use it actively often to integrate information from different sources and hold it in mind. So um, here's a few more examples, everyday examples of how we use working memory in our everyday life. So imagine you, you're driving to an unfamiliar area. Um, you know exactly where you're going because you've looked at the map, but it all goes awry and um, everything else fails, you sat there fails and you just stop and ask someone how to get to wherever it is you want to go. And they say, they give you a sequence of instructions, usually delivered at a high pace. Um, first right, second left after the lights, and then you'll see it there directly opposite the church. Um, in this situation, we're able to use our working memory, so we do have this capacity to hold entirely novel information which isn't actually very meaningful to us at the time um, but it's very fragile and um, what we'll often find is that unless we can really focus hold it all in mind while we're navigating an unfamiliar area look for landmarks then we'll find that that information has deserted us by the time we come to the second or maybe the the final step so that's a good example of both what it feels like to struggle with working memory and, and how it might fail um, another more academically relevant one is multiplying numbers together. Um, we don't do this every day, but we can do it. So um, multiply 15 by 26 um, without recourse to any external device. So we can all do it. It's quite a struggle. Um, we have to carry out interim um, calculations, hold the products of those calculations while we're carrying out further calculations and then um, put them together. So again, that's an example of um, using working memory. If we had to multiply 154 by 267, then most of us probably just couldn't do it. Um, we've actually got exactly the same, we, it draws on exactly the same knowledge of number, but what's exceeded is that capacity that we have to hold information from different sources um, and to process information at the same time. So we've exceeded the capacity of working memory. So I hope you've got a feeling for what working memory is from this. Um, it's the most temporary of, work, of our memory systems, as I'll um, describe in a minute. And um, it, I often think of it as just, it isn't really, it's almost not like a memory system. It's holding information, the present in mind and keeping the present in mind as time goes forward for just a brief period of time. So it's pretty ha handy to have this um, mental workspace or mental notepad that's available to us all, at all time. But there are snags, and I've already alluded to those. It's limited in capacity, so there's only so much information that we can hold, and that so much isn't very much. It varies between us, and I'll say something about that in a minute. Um, it also requires focused attention. So to hold anything in working memory, you can't just try and remember and then forget about it because you just lose the contents. And um, so you need to hold you need to focus and really not direct your attention to anything else to keep the contents still in the present for you. Um, and when you lose information, 
it's often what we call catastrophic loss. So the information is gone and it can't be recovered. So it's a great system to have, up your sleeve, but it um, has its hazards. And as we'll see, it seems to have quite an impact on kids in learning situations. So just a very brief context for working memory. I've already described what working or short term memory is. Um, it holds the focus of attention for very, very brief periods of time for as long as we can sustain our attention. Um, another system, a longer what psychologists call long term memory, often also called episodic memory, is our memory for relatively recent events like what we did earlier in the day or where we went to yesterday. And we tend to have what we call recollective experience for those um, events. So we can almost recreate what it was like to sit at the breakfast table this morning, what we had, what we interacted with, what we were wearing. Um, and then that fades across time. So in a week's time, it'll be much harder to remember, if at all, exactly how it was for you at breakfast this morning. So that's one form of longer term memory. Um, the really useful long term memory, a much more durable working memory system that's critical for um, education and learning is semantic memory. And this is memory for things that we've learned and we've learned, we've encountered many times and they become very solid pieces of knowledge which can actually endure and be accessible to us if the conditions are right for the rest of our lifetime. So, for example, our, um, under, our familiarity with um, relatively common words, what their meaning is, the fact that Paris is the capital, uh, capital of France, um, these will be lifetime facts for us. Um, we have to revisit these facts occasionally, so things we've just learnt and then we don't revisit may, may actually drop out of um, semantic memory. But the trick really, um, you could characterise learning as involving trying to find ways of shifting information, experience, knowledge into that internal knowledge system that we have, which is semantic memory. Final long term memory system is autobiographical memory, which is absolutely fascinating, but it's the subject of another talk. OK, so why are we interested in, in working memory and how does it impact on the classroom? Well, one of the um, important facts is that it, uh, the capacity to hold information in working memory varies very widely across age, um, particularly over the school period and also between individuals. So what I've shown here, I hope you can see the cursor. This is the average line. This is the mean um, working memory score. The scale doesn't matter and she's not particularly meaningful in this case, um, but for kids be ranging from five to 15 years of age. And what you'll see is that um, the capacity of working memory increases by uh, uh, about two, slightly, possibly two and a half times over these school years. Um, and that the steepest development is found during the primary school years and then it tends to level off. And these are actually adult levels of working memory. And um, so that's quite straightforward. So what we might think is that according to the particular age group that you're teaching, you might have some clear idea about how much information they're likely to be able to hold in working memory. Um, unfortunately, that isn't the case. And if you look at the bars here, then the top of each of these, um, the top bar corresponds to the score of the child who's at the, in the top 10% 10, 10 for their age group in working memory terms. And the, bo the bottom bar is the child at the bottom 10% for their age group in terms of working memory scores. And you can see there's a huge difference between the on average, the lowest three and the top three kids in each class. Um, what this means, in fact, this range is almost bigger than the whole range of development, of typical development. So focus now on kids who are eight years old and their average scores there. But the child who's there in the bottom 10th centile has the working memory capacity of a five year old. The child who is in the top 10% has near adult levels of working memory capacity. So within the standard mixed classroom, we have a huge range um, of abilities to be able to hold information in mind. So we can't really rely on every child being able to um, fle be flexible and um, have the capacity to store almost everything that we care to throw at them. So why does it matter that working memory varies and how do we know that it does? Um, the, 
the, here are some of the characteristics. So about 15 years ago, we spent quite a lot of time trying to understand. We knew there were links between working memory measures and kids' performance in school, but we wanted to know why it was. And we sat and observed the children, spent a lot of time trying to understand how working memory impacted the behaviour that then would have a consequence for learning. And the first thing we found was that very consistently, children who score poorly on, on measures of working memory, um, which are quite easy to assess, struggle to make academic progress. So tend to do poorly in national curriculum assessments, for example, and almost any other academic assessments that are given. Um, I've said it, they do poorly in English and maths, but also in science at key stage three. So it straddles the whole period of um, education. Um, we also found, and this was a really interesting observation from being in the classroom, that they have real difficulties in following instructions. And some classrooms are very instruction heavy environments. So here's an example of a, a real instruction that we observed. So a teacher said to, um, I think this was year, two, year one children, put your sheets on the green table, um, arrow cards in the packet, put your pencil away and come and sit on the carpet. So there's a lot of language there. There's a lot of um, information, sequenced information the children have to hold. There's four different steps. And what we found is that the ch children with relatively low working memory um, typically carried out the first step of the instructions, but rarely got through to the final step. And they sometimes skip from the first to the last. And it appears that actually they'd forgotten. Um, if you look at the, the working memory assessments for those kids, it's not surprising because they couldn't possibly have remembered all that information for even a brief period in time. And in fact, we used a lot of these instructions in an experiment that we carried out with Durham University undergraduates, psychology undergraduates, and we gave the same instructions to them and often they couldn't um, repeat them either. So um, the classroom can be rather a working memory heavy environment. The kids tend to lose track in complex tasks, particularly those involving the mental transfer of information. For example, copying information from the board seems straightforward, but lots of information gets lost in that transfer for low working memory kids. Um, in older children, we see that there are particular problems in organising complex material, combining um, information from different sources, for example, into a coherent structure and actually following um, the content of lectures and lessons, particularly if note taking is involved, which imposes quite a heavy processing load. So um, there's a whole constellation of um, really of practical problems that these children are facing. We were interested in what the other people thought about these children, um, particularly we asked teachers and we've asked families um, about the children without actually identifying that um, in, in our terms, they have working memory problems. Um, they never said, we alluded to um, working memory problems, but they would often say, for example, they have, oh, he or she's got a really short attention span, doesn't listen to a word I say, it's in one ear and out of the other, um, and also describe the children as easily distracted. Um, actually, kids with ADHD um, also, well, they, they tend to have exactly these problems too, um, but the whole, whole ADHD um, syndrome doesn't, doesn't necessarily involve um, working memory problems only. So how can we make sense of this? What can we take home um, and in terms of supporting these children within the classroom, is there anything we can do about it? Well, firstly, our conclusion is that overloaded working memory for, for many kids and working memory failure when everything drops out of working memory, for example, due to interruptions, are common sources of problems in learning. And in all those individual learning episodes that the kids the kids are engaging um, every day in the classroom, if in many of those cases they simply can't successfully complete the task because of working memory problems, that, that will necessarily impair their steady um, or the hoped for progress along the um, academic curriculum. So how best can we support them? Um, the obvious solution when we started looking um, into this, um, looking at the children in this way in terms of their behaviour uh, about 15 years ago, was to turn to direct training. Um, and you, you probably know there's been big interest in cognitive training where you identify a particular cognitive skill and then you give lots and lots of intensive training, motivations to improve and um, crank up the difficulty as individuals include on cognitive training tasks and see if they um, deliver the benefits. Um, what we and many other people um, have now concluded is that you can't really train working memory capacity. 
Um, you can give a, mem a working memory task, you can train it and performance does improve. Um, however, the individuals following training won't be much better at all at any other working memory task other than the one they've trained. So it's a very specific set of skills. They've almost learned to carry out the task in a particular way that doesn't tax their working memory. And in terms of children, they show no learning benefits. So we don't see any improvement in reading, maths, and um, other indices of academic performance. So unfortunately, it looks like working memory, uh, um, working memory training isn't um, panacea um, in, any, in any educational terms. Um, so I think what that leads us mainly with is the type of support that, that we can provide within the academic environment, within the child's learning environment, to try and mitigate the impacts and avoid, in many cases, the impacts of working memory load on learning. And um, here are some of the ways in which a school based approach that draws on what's known about working memory and what can be helped to, and what we can, what we can and what we can't do might include some of the following elements. So firstly, we think, I think it's very important that that schools, teachers, um, support staff um, are familiar with the signs of working memory failure. So there are a consistent set of signs um, in a child's behaviour that suggests that at that point, they're failing to meet the working memory challenges of whatever it is they're doing. Um, the most frequent of these is inattention. So the kids just aren't paying attention to the task. They've gone off task. Um, sometimes they might be gazing um, out of the window, um, daydreaming. Um, otherwise, they might be distracted and distractible. They may distract other children. They may move to another task. Um, and we actually see these, this type of inattention as almost the other side of the coin from working memory from working memory failure so to remember what you're to complete a task you have to remember what you're doing if you can no longer remember what you're doing because working memory is overloaded all you can do is something else and it may be just motoring daydreaming um, not focusing on anything external or it may be just engaging in a new task um, the children don't aren't successful in following instructions, so they seem to be somewhat lost in a task. They're not completing activities. And in those activities that involve transferring one piece of information to another or putting them together, they're really struggling. Now, there are lots of other reasons why these types of behaviours might be exhibited, but certainly they, they are um, features of working memory failure. So maybe we can be a bit smarter by combining um, vigilance for those signs of working memory with an awareness of what pupils might be at particular risk of low working memory problems. Um, and there are all sorts of sources of information that we have, we could have that we could use to identify kids who might be at risk. Um, foundation stage profiles, for example, are quite a rich source of information from the kids um, at that earlier point. Um, so particularly with respect to behaviours related to listening and attention and the ability to listen to others, to stay on task, understanding the ab ability to follow instructions. So these are all elements that are actually tapped and will potentially be flagged up within the um, foundation stage profile as areas of difficulty. So early on in the child's academic career, we might have some indication that children who have those types of problems probably are at risk of enduring working memory problems. And I should say they tend to be enduring, they don't resolve spontaneously. Um, school progress below expectations, so a child is just not doing as well as you think they, they should be doing. Um, that's another risk factor. The other possibility is direct working memory assessments. Um, there are ways of actually quite fast assessments of children's working memory capacity, probably only take a few minutes. Um, and there are also behaviour checklists which describe the types of behaviours associated with working memory problems. And a, a child who scores poorly on in those types of behaviour or has these um, red light aspects of behaviour could be considered to be at risk too. Um, so um, how about in terms of the delivery of education, how, how the, the child actually receives information? Um, it's possible to um, manage the memory loads, the working memory loads, um, in many different ways. We know that breaking down complex activities into separate steps and the instructions for how to do them into separate steps um, will really help many children. Um, 
language, complex language, complex language with lots of um, extra um, words that aren't critical um, will um, will in itself distract the child and make it much harder for the child with working memory problems to extract the gist. So simple active language is important. Um, excuse me, I'm just going to turn off my clock. There we go. Uh, hopefully back with me. Let's get back. Um, uh, noise management's important, so children with working memory problems are highly distracted by others speaking to them, extraneous noise, um, being prepared to repeat instructions. Quite often we found that kids with working memory problems did ask for help um, and for information to be repeated to them and it wasn't always available. And memory aids. Um, I should say that memory aids seem an obvious um, uh, source of, of offsetting working memory problems, but they only seem to work if a child's highly familiar with using them. And for younger children below about eight years of age, they have to be very simple too. And the children tend not to spontaneously choose to use memory aids. Um, with older children, it's, um, I think, a bit more promising. A final step is simply to foster pupil awareness of memory. So a really interesting finding from our um, observational work is that we found that the kids, when they were drowning in failed working memory, they were able to tell you, I've forgotten what I'm doing. I can't remember. I don't know what to do next. So even young children do have insight as to when memory fails them. Um, we think that an approach, a school approach in which memory is talked about, children talk about, what their experiences are, what's hard to remember, what the, what sort of strategies they are, um, what to do if, what if you've forgotten something, what's appropriate to do, might actually be helpful. And in older children, it's possible to work with them to discover their own areas of strength that they can then build on in terms of strategies. I'm not going to talk through this last slide um, due to time, but in older um, children and young people up to university students, um, many of them with working memory problems succeed and get to these high levels of education. And they do so by developing highly individual strategies. So that's really important for older children. Uh, I'm going to end um, at this point. Um, there are lots of sources of information around about working memory. Um, I'm a bit embarrassed about um, favouring my, my own two guides here, but um, you might find them useful. The one on the left, Understanding Working Memory Classroom Guide, is available at the link that's shown here. It's freely available and it's just a very short um, uh, teacher-oriented text. And um, there's also a book, Working Memory and Learning, that provides a bit more background. Um, and at that point, I'll finish. Thank you.